why don't we get started then? So welcome back from the poster sessions, all who were able to go. They were really fascinating. Saw some great posters myself. I wish we had more time to get to all of them. And so we are up to session two, uh, which is on the intersection of large language models and materials data. The chairs are uh, Ben Blazik and uh, Jali Shi from MIT, Ben from University of Chicago. So I'm going to throw it over to Ben to take over the rest of the session and the kickoff. Thanks. Yep. Actually, Jale is uh, is going to take the kickoff, so we'll kick it over to him. Yeah. Uh, like in this section, uh, is about uh, the intersection of uh, large language model and the materials data. So, what can large language model do? Large language model has attracted uh, like the broad scientific community attentions uh, because of their remarkable care capabilities uh, in understanding, summarizing, uh, reasoning, inferring, as well as generate and predict new content. And uh, the multi-model la large, large language models have further generated, uh, uh, further broadened these capabilities uh, in uh, image and video generation and processing. Uh, here is the Sora just released by OpenAI last week, uh, which can uh, create a high quality videos uh, from text. Uh, in the field of uh, chemistry and uh, materials, uh, material science, uh, large language models uh, have uh, demonstrated their utilities across uh, uh, various applications, uh, such as uh, uh, predicting the properties of molecular and the materials, designing automation and the novel uh, interfaces, uh, uh, attracting uh, knowledge from unstructured data, as well as developing new technology tools. In today's section, uh, we will have uh, uh, four speakers uh, uh, to uh, share their uh, experience on how to leverage large language model to advance the research in chemistry and the material science. Uh, uh, Daniel Boyko from CMU, uh, Daphne uh, Suchi uh, from Duke University, Christopher Knies from University of Bayloi, German, and uh, uh, Venice uh, uh, Vinegar <coughs> Venuka Powell from uh, MIT. So, no. Can uh, our first speaker, uh, Daniel Boyko, uh, set up and then I'll uh, have the introduction of Daniel Boyko? Yep, thank you. Um, uh, so, Daniel Boyko is a PhD student uh, in CMU, uh, advised by uh, Gabe Gomes. Uh, <clears throat> Daniel is particularly interested in machine learning uh, for such areas of chemistry uh, as the catalysis and the analytical chemistry. Daniel is the first author of the paper, Autonomous uh, Chem Chemical Research with Large Language Model, published uh, at Nature uh, uh, last December. No. Uh, yep, uh, thank you. So, um, uh, uh, yep. Yeah, so, I will, I will be focusing on this project on autonomous chemical research with large language models. Uh, and I think there are many open questions and open problems uh, that we can find in applying LLMs for uh, natural science. So uh, LLMs did like really big uh, progress in uh, re re uh, recent year. And there are like many, many really exciting applications for uh, uh, different uh, uh, different areas of science. Oh, the new. Uh, we yeah. cannot do slides. Yeah. Uh, wait. Yeah. Uh, one second. It's, it's... Oh, yeah. Um. So, uh, does it work? We uh, still can't see your slides. Uh, sorry. Can you try stopping sharing and then restart? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry about that. Uh. Yeah. AGI almost arrived, but we still have problems with slides. Yeah, no. Oh, there it goes. There you go. Yeah. So, uh, LMs did like really big progress in uh, in recent year and uh, really been applied like almost everywhere. Uh, but I think just personally, the coolest part of uh, what we can do with them is actually that we can def design systems that use various tools to achieve the goal. And what we really can do with LLMs, we uh, move away from uh, from the way we do science before, move away even from traditional automation techniques where we still have to define 
what's uh, going to happen in the lab uh, to just take a natural prompt and then being integrated uh, seamlessly with experiment automation uh, and perform experiments in the physical world. Um, and we designed the system the following way. So we have uh, input prompt from scientist. And for example, you can write that like performs this kind of experiment or discovers this catalyst or do something like that. Uh, and then this system can, uh, uh, as, as, as its main module, which is like planner, which is inside is just uh, GPT-4, uh, GPT-4 thread, it can access various tools. For example, it can access web search, it can uh, access code execution, uh, documentation search and automation. And each of these individual tools, they have integrations with either uh, information sources from outside. So you do web search, you connect to the internet, you connect to Google search. Uh, in case of code execution, you have um, access to Python environment. Uh, for automation, you have access to physical equipment in real world. Uh, and for documentation search, you have access to hardware documentation. And now the main the main uh, task for the planner is just choose the right order of tools to ex execute and plan how these tools are being called. Um, and uh, in this paper, we actually evaluate everything module by module. So we start with evaluation of web search module, and we designed a set of seven compounds. We ask various models, including models that augmented with web search, uh, to provide synthesis of these compounds. And you can see, for example, the GPT-4 uh, completely uh, uh, completely hallucinizes uh, synthesis of ibuprofen. So. Uh, it's like one of the main problems with, uh, with language models. But at the same time, when you provide access to the internet, uh, you get maybe not so detailed, but correct synthesis. Um, for documentation search, uh, we have full custom retrieval augmented generation implementations. Uh, for ECL, for example, what we do, we have uh, input queries, we search them in the function list, then we map uh, these functions to individual pages from documentation and we aggregate all the data and provide it back to the planner. So again, we uh, the tool is just used to provi provide planner with uh, information required to proceed. Um, we also show that uh, this system can uh, control hardware and uh, it writes uh, uh, mostly correct code for, for liquid handlers. So for open trunks, you can see these examples when we can ask as a planner to write a code for, to color every other row of 96 well plate, and it will successfully do it. And finally, you can uh, make even more complex experiments. So here we integrate all the different tools together to solve quite complex tasks, to perform Suzuki and Sanga shell reactions, and we provide textual description of our setup. So the model has information about uh, what tips it has, hit or shaker modules, uh, the pads and information about available regions. So to perform some Gashira, it, it, it will have to choose A1, one of B1, B4, one of C1, C2, and one, one of D1, D2. Uh, and we show that uh, uh, just by calling various tools, running calculations for stichiometry, uh, writing code for liquid handlers, these models can successfully perform experiments uh, in the real world. And when we do analysis of this uh, reaction mixtures, we see both products for both Suzuki and Sengashiro reactions. Uh, but I think like, the main, uh, when you when you talk about this work, uh, the main pushback uh, is that uh, uh, these systems are not intelligent, uh, meaning that they cannot use previously collected knowledge uh, to design new experiments and choose what to do next. And uh, we try to evaluate this as well. So we have experiments for reaction optimization and uh, we have uh, very strong indications that uh, models, uh, uh, I don't want to say think, but they, they consider chemistry in uh, making next steps. So in this example, we had a game of 20 different uh, 20 steps where model at every step has to choose ligand additive and base. And then uh, once it gets ligand additive and base, uh, we return yield of the reaction. And you can see that uh, scores of these models increase, they increase over time, they manage to reuse previously collected data to guide further actions. Uh, but 
in all those works, there are many open challenges. Uh, and I would say that there are three main groups of challenges. So the first challenge is safety. How do we evaluate safety of these models? And we did some work uh, trying to do this evaluation. We uh, have a test set of schedule one and two drugs and chemical wep weapon agents. Uh, and in some mod in some cases, uh, model proceeds all the way through to synthesis. So evaluation is really important and guardrails are important here. Uh, second big direction is tool development. What tools we need? Uh, uh, can we develop a universal format for tools? Uh, and uh, I mean, probably for natural sciences, there will be some difference in inputs. So uh, this universal scientific, input, uh, scientific format for tools would be important. Also, can LLMs make tools on their own? And there are some developments in this area as well. Finally, custom models and multimodality. So this work is, is uh, built on top of GPT-4. Uh, open source models are still not very good in using tools and uh, uh, there is lots of work to be done there. Uh, also, can these models benefit from multimodality and not only from images, but different formats of scientific information? So we could imagine uh, having a multimodal model that takes spectra as separate modality, like NMR spectra. Um, uh, can we integrate different data formats? Uh, and do we actually need domain knowledge? So the main question about GPT-4 is that, uh, for example, it doesn't know chemistry, but uh, maybe we just need the right set of tools. And thank you. Oh, thanks, Daniel. It's exciting to hear how large language models can be used for autonomous uh, experiment. Uh, next, let's welcome Daphne uh, Search. Uh, can you set up? Yeah. So Daphne is a second year PhD student at Duke, co-advised uh, co by Kat Brisson and uh, Bowen Dingra. Uh, Daphne is working on information attraction in science domain using language models. Daphne aims to process scientific articles at a scale and uh, build a material database that can be uh, used uh, to accelerate scientific uh, discovery. Uh, their team is one of the 2023 large language model materials chemistry hexon winner. Uh, now let's welcome uh, Daphne. Thank you. Um, can you see my screen? Okay, great. Hi everyone, I'm Daphne. My presentation is on using large language models to mine materials literature. If you're working in materials domain, you probably utilize the data scarcity problem in this field. It is very difficult to find the data that we're looking for. They're usually locked in scientific articles and people have been working on creating databases so that this information is more accessible to others. But this is very time consuming and tedious. It can take up to months. And large language models have shown promise in automating this process. In our work, we um, are extracting information from polymer non-composite domain, but we believe that the findings here can be used, um, can be potentially used in other domains as well. From each article, we extract information from different modalities such as text, tables, and figures, and combine all this information to feed into a large language model in order to get the information in a structured machine-readable format. I will focus on information extraction from tables in this presentation, but it is crucial to combine all this information for a comprehensive context. What kind of information are we looking for? Experimental scientists go into lab and test their hypothesis by synthesizing several samples. And for each samples, they report information such as the materials they've used, how they process them, what kind of characterization equipment is used to obtain the resulting properties. So for each article, we are interested in extracting set of sample information. And since, since it is important to connect the right materials with the right properties, we initially started on extracting materials and properties. 
Most of the work in this field have been focused on text. So we've also done some work on this. And if you're interested in learning more, um, my research partner, Gazal, is presenting a poster tomorrow. So you should check out her work um, to learn more about this one. But I will focus more on tables because we realized that just by looking at text, we are missing some of the important information. And one example is the properties. Properties are widely available in tables, not so much in text. Um, so we decided to include tables in our data set as well. And you might think that, great, the information is already condensed and this, is, um, this looks like it's structured. But we've soon realized that people are very creative in the way they um, make their tables. Even in the same domain, they look very different from each other. There are no global standards. Um, the data presented here um, can vary a lot. And that's why we realized that parsing these articles all together is not an easy task. And we started to think about how to represent this information um, in, a good, uh, in a good way and came up with three different approaches. The first one is to take the image of the table and provide it into a multimodal model such as GPT for vision together with the captions of the table. And secondly, we extract the text from this table and provide this to a language model together with the captions. And lastly, we extract the information from the tables in a structured format, such as CSV files. And our prompt includes the selected input model together with a couple of examples um, and specific details instructions about how to fill in the JSON template that we provide. Evaluation is crucial, but it is also very complex. In composite domain, and the material information consists of the composition, including metrics name, filler name, and composition. And for each sample in our human annotated data set that we call ground truth, we match each of these entities with the ones in the predictions. It is a little bit more difficult when it comes to properties and properties conditions, because this time we don't know um, the set of entities. Um, whereas properties uh, can be studied in a single study. So we came up with a strategy find, to find the match between the properties in the ground truth and the properties in the predictions. And we also extract the details such as the value, um, units, and conditions. And there can be also multiple conditions. So we also came up with a method to find, to match the conditions. So in summary, um, it is important to come up with robust evaluation techniques that fits your own purpose. And we need to be um, allow for some flexibility because of um, the fluid language we use in materials. We collected a data set of 18 articles. And from those, we um, selected 37 tables that contain composition and properties information. And in total, they um, contained 182 samples. For composition, we used accuracy for um, our evaluation metric. And we found that the uh, most promising model was the GPT-4 vision model, when an image um, table image was used as an input. And for property names, we used a font score for evaluation, and again, found that the image method worked the best. In summary, we wanted to stress the importance of evaluation and account um, and having flexibility in the evaluation um, and the, how we represent your table matters and it's gonna affect the results you will observe. And there are still some ongoing challenges that we would like to address in our future work. Um, and also we want to work on granular benchmarking to be able to compare extraction from different entities and different large language models and integrate that the work that we've done in the text together with the tables and also um, finally uh, expand our method to include other domains of material science as well. 
I would like to thank everyone who has supported this project and me. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, Stephanie. It's exciting to learn how like a prompt engineering LM uh, can be used for data attraction from text and tables. Uh, next, uh, let's welcome uh, Chris uh, Kunas. Uh, Chris, could you set up? Yep, yep, working on it. Uh, uh, Chris is uh, uh, an assistant professor at the University of uh, Baroi, German. Uh, the Kunis group at the uh, uh, University of Baroi uh, utilizes uh, machine learning in material science, uh, making materials discovery, design, development, and deployment faster, more streamlined, and accessible. Uh, Chris is the first author of the uh, Polybert. A uh, chemical engineering model to a uh, chemical large language model to enable for machine driving out straight faster polymer formats. Uh, let's welcome Chris. Yeah, hi everyone. Can you see my uh, screen? Yes, okay, awesome. So, yeah, uh, just quickly about me. My name is Chris Kinnett, and um, all the work that I show today has been done during my time as an AVH uh, postdoc fellow at Georgia Tech and Rapid Rapid Group. I just recently became a assistant professor in Germany. And uh, yeah, in case you, let's see, there's a pointer here. There you go. Uh, in case you want to, you know, ping me or contact me, please free to use all these channels here. And today I'm going to talk about Polybird. Um, Polybird is, I think, something very interesting, it's a large language model that helps us to make ultra-fast predictions of polymers, so actually also maybe molecules uh, to some extent. It is a bit different than like using like, or like the way we use, usually use uh, large language models. So on this slide, uh, on the right side, you can see polybird, like if you would ask a you know, large language model like to picture polybird, it will, will come up something like this. Uh, so. And um, yeah, here you can say hi to Polybird, and Polybird will say, hi, I'm Polybird. I'm a large language model, but I actually speak polymer. I don't speak the natural language. And this is also the main difference here. So uh, polymer, uh, Polybird actually speaks in terms of piece miles. So it has learned the, a polymer representation uh, uh, in, in, in the form of piece miles or smile strings. So it would understand like strings like this here, like this is a, um, a smile representation, like a, a character representation, string representation of a polymer uh, polyethylene here. Um, and by training polybird, not a natural language, by training it on polymer language and chemical language, it actually also learns grammar and orthography, like how to write uh, these polymer smile strings and how they're connected to each other. So, and by training it on a large amount of data on a large amount of polymers, it uh, has somehow learned, uh, you know, chemical intuition or, uh, or its expressions are chemical pertinent, so they have some meaning. So the key, key idea of behind Polybird is actually to take a natural language model and convert it to a chemical language model. So we train it on a real chemical language, like a language we design ourselves. So how is it used? In a, you know, traditional materials informatics or like polymer informatics or whatever pipeline, if you want to predict like a property, for example, or even for other, um, uh, you know, tasks, you uh, usually start with the data set, you go to some kind of fingerprint, which is some, you know, you know, uh, numerical representation, meaningful numerical representation of your input data, which is usually not in a form that can directly be used for uh, machine learning models. Once you have that, you go to downstream predictors. And then, of course, once you're done, you want to use your model for inference purpose, you want to do something nice with it, you want to do predictions. That's the slow path here, which you can see, uh, you know, like this snake symbol here. That's the old path. The new path, and that's where Polybird comes in, is replacing the slow fingerprinting part with a new ultra-fast fingerprint capability. And 
as I told you already, the you know, polymer fingerprints actually also have chemical meaning. So they're chemical meaningful, meaning that if you uh, project, if you generate a latent space representation for a lot of polymers and you, for example, measure um, the similarity by, you know, some, some distance metrics in your latent space representation, that you will find that the similarity has actually a meaning. And the you know very important thing about polybert is actually the acceleration. So it's like 215 times, like two more than two orders of magnitude faster than the best approaches we had so far. And this is very important if you think about you know this large materials universe. I just call it the materials universe, which is this universe which contains all the materials you can you know kind of think of, which have been synthesized or not been synthesized. If you want to search that then you need extremely fast capabilities and experiments cannot be, you know, the goal to, and they're just not fast enough, at least right now. And also traditional pipelines are not fast enough. But now because polybar is so fast, we can, you know, tell polybar to search this materials universe. Um, and if we do that, then we might think of like, how this actually works in the background. And for this, I, you know, kind of like married or like Polybert fell in love with this uh, thing I call data fusion models on the right. Uh, it's one thing I developed in my past works and you might wonder why it's a pig and a crane symbol here, but I also call these models sometimes like check of all trades models and this, uh, I'm German and this translates to something in Germany, which means like a pig, which is, you know, laying some eggs. That's why I chose this symbol here. And if you marry them, then you can achieve ultra-fast, really ultra-fast property predictions in the polymer universe. And by ultra-fast, I mean that we were able to, you know, uh, to predict 29 properties of 100 million polymers in 13 hours. So this is really, really fast. I guess like in an experiment, you might need 13 days or 13 weeks for one data point here. Uh, we can do like 100 million polymers. And by the way, I also published this data set. I called it Poly1. It's available on Sinodo for free. So it's a synthetic, a synthetic data set of polymers, but I think it's actually also quite useful maybe for some downstream predictions and help. Yeah, on the right side, you can actually see the comparison between traditional fingerprinting and the polymer fingerprinting. And it, you know, just overall, it shows that the accuracy is also the same. So it's much, much faster at the same accuracy. Yeah, uh, then this is my last slide, last slide just wrapping up. Uh, so I talked about Polybert. Uh, Polybert is a large language model, you know, large to some extent. It's not as large as just GPT-4 or GPT-3.5 or, you know, it has less parameters than that, but <laughs> still it has a lot. So I don't know when you start calling it large, actually. Um, so it speaks polymer, like the polymer language. So it's some kind of a polymer linguist because it has learned the language. It has learned the domain language that we, you know, chemists or uh, engineers came up with, which is kind of a nice idea. I think we can put forward to it, uh, like uh, to answer other questions maybe too. And to some extent, it's also a polymer chemist because it now understands polymer chemistry because it has learned these strings and, you know, how maybe some structured or parts in your polymer are connected or will influence some other parts and so on. So how these connections, like the attention essentially we have in sentences, this would be a, the attention between different structural parts of your polymer. And it helps to make auto fast polymer property predictions for you know, exploring this gigantic polymer universe, which I think is a very nice effort. And also the one, one big advantage also is that it scales very nicely on cloud infrastructure. So you can deploy it to you know, Google Cloud or whatever, scale it up to, because it works on TPUs, right? So this is just very easy to scale and you, you can explore a lot. And uh, it works, by the way, for molecules too, like these polymer smile strings and smile strings are very, very similar. So I tried it for molecules uh, and it works also pretty well, something which is also kind of expected. Uh, and also with small modifications, it can also be used for the inverse design test. So I showed you the first forward design test so you, input a polymer, you get the property prediction, but you can also invert that. Yeah, but that, uh, yeah, just, you know, mentioning that that would actually, was actually done in Georgia Tech during my time as an ABH postdoc. And yeah, thanks for listening. Looking forward to questions. 
Yeah, thanks, Chris. Uh, we have the question in the panel discussion. Uh, uh, it's so great to learn how language models can be used to advance polymer informatics. Uh, now let's welcome our next speaker, uh, Venice uh, Venuga Paul. Uh, Venice is a post postdoc scholar at MIT, working in the group of Professor uh, Elsa Alvedi. Uh, Venice's work is primarily focused on using uh, and developing large language models to advance the discovery and uh, the development of new materials by uh, autonomously extract the insights and the data from scientific literatures. Now let's welcome uh, Venice. Thank you, Gio. Uh, can you guys see my screen? Awesome. Uh, so my name is Vineet. I am a postdoc with uh, Elsa Olivetti at MIT. Our group works broadly on information extraction from scientific literature. Uh, we have uh, many avenues that we have explored in the space. We have worked on extraction of challenges in scaling lithium ion batteries and sodium ion batteries, as well as the mitigation strategies that was explored autonomously using NLP. We have worked on identifying faces and their properties in aluminum alloys. And I have specifically worked in generating autonomous knowledge graphs and knowledge discovery within these knowledge graphs using link prediction, all using NLP-based methods. However, for the rest of the time, I would like to focus on what I think are four interesting points about LLMs that might be interesting for the community as a whole. The first is that LLMs are largely being seen as reasoning engines. Uh, and what this means is, while large language models are trained on traditionally linguistic tasks, such as completing sentences, translating between languages, summarizing documents, or answering questions from these documents, what these large language models end up learning in the process are first and second order logical reasoning. And this in turn means that LLMs can be used as reasoning agents. So we already saw an example of this in Daniil's work. Um, another a good example that I like is the recent work on mech agents by Marcus Mueller, where he showed that you could use multiple large language models or all working collaboratively in solving a larger problem. So he first defines a, gener a generic problem, which is first transferred to a large language model that works as a chat manager. The chat manager assigns this task to the planner. The planner comes up with the sequence of actions that need to be done to solve this problem, which is then distributed to different large language models, one called the scientist, one called the engineer, one called the critic, and they all solve this problem problem working in collaboration with each other. So this sort of application of reasoning agents extends the traditional capability of machine language models beyond the usual classification, regression, and clustering task. The second point that I like to highlight is that uh, ensembles of large language models traditionally seem to perform better over single large language models. So in the work that I'm doing now, uh, I'm trying to create uh, a specific ontology for material science. So the task is we have identified some entities and the context in which these entities are present. And a large language model is tasked with identifying the correct relationship between these two entities based on the context. Now, the challenge is that a single large language model is going to hallucinate. So when multiplied over millions of triples and examples like these, that's uh, an error that we may not be able to quantify. So instead, what we do is we train multiple large language models on this task, and the final result is created as an aggregate, a weighted aggregate of all these large language models. And we have seen that this sort of ensemble approach uh, does per better over a single large language model. And the idea behind this is that while a large language model can hallucinate, it's sort of impossible for all large language models to hallucinate at the same time uh, over the same set of data. So if you have multiple models, they sort of compensate and cancel each other out. The third point is that 
we all work with hardware challenges. We all work with, uh, most of us at least work with a finite number of GPUs. And what this means that it effectively constrains the type of large language models that we can work with. So empirically, we have seen that uh, for a model to be useful, it needs to have at least one to five billion parameters as a lower bound. And we know that larger models like GPT traditionally perform better than smaller models like Llama. Uh, but we also see that if you fine tune a smaller model, it tends to work as well as a general large language model like GPT 3.5 or even 4. Now, the challenge is that fine tuning requires four times as much memory as a base model. So it's not just enough that you are able to fit a model into a GPU. You also need to have the memory needed to fine tune it. Now, this effectively narrows us for the in the context of most uh, lab accessible GPUs to more parameters between one and 50 billion parameters. So this means that uh, you need to use techniques like LoRa and quantized LoRa to crop these models further. And this in turn leads me to point number four, which is that we need to establish, it will be helpful for us to establish some community-wide benchmarks. So Daniel already pointed this out and as did some other speakers, uh, we don't have clear data on what is the state of the art for material science related task when it comes to large language models. So we don't know if some particular language model is as good as GPT-3 or GPT-4, for example, uh, an open source language model that is. We also don't have clear evidence of whether domain specific training on these model actually works better than uh, a base model. Uh, we also don't know the trade-off between uh, what is the uh, trade-off in using a quantized large language model versus a base language model on the same task. And this is especially important because we have a new model coming out every couple of months. You can just see the total number of models that have come out between 2020 and 2023 in this image here. So having a community-wide benchmark with LLM specific task that we can update uh, and inform us would be very helpful. And that finally leads me to the last point, which is the maybe it's time for one multi-model large language model to rule them all, right? So uh, perhaps it is an opportunity for us as a community to come together, use all the data that we have and to generate uh, one large language model that might be applicable and useful for all of us. Uh, with that, I yield the rest of my time and I look forward to the discussions. Thank you.